this crisis represents really a watershed moment for Europe. And we have been seeing over the last 10, 10 days uh, a U-turn of really long-lasting foreign policy and energy policy uh, guidelines in Europe in general and in Germany in specific. Hours after Russian tanks roared over Ukraine's borders, German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock made this chilling statement. We buy 50% of our gas from Russia. If we exclude Russia from the SWIFT payment system, the lights in Germany will go out. A few weeks ago, in episode 44, Europe braces for winter, we wondered whether the soaring of energy prices could lead to mass blackouts across Europe. But we never expected those tensions to be compounded by Russia's astonishing invasion of Ukraine. This naked act of aggression has made starkly obvious our energetic dependence on Russia, which provides nearly half of our gas and a quarter of our oil. Such a reliance has logically hampered the EU's capacity to hit at Russia's crucial energy sector, despite the Biden administration calls for a total decoupling with Russia on oil and gas. This week, we turn to Nick Butler and Simone Taglia-Pietra, two experts of the geopolitics of energy, to take stock of Europe's dependency. How long can the EU survive without Russian gas? And can Russia's aggression spark a much-needed strategic approach to energy debates? As per every week, thanks a lot to all of our wonderful patrons who continue to back us. Their support allow us to pay for our physical and digital equipment and plan for the long term. So, if you find yourself coming back every week to Uncommon Decency, maybe it is time to make your contribution on Patreon. You can even join our weekly sessions where we prepare for our upcoming episodes. If you can't spare the $5 or so a month, you can always write a review on Apple Podcasts, subscribe on Spotify, and share the show with your friends. All of this really helps boost the show's visibility and attract new and exciting speakers. Now, on to the show. Fantastic. So for this conversation, we are so glad to be joined by Nick Butler. Nick Butler, you're an energy economist, the chair of various companies, a visiting professor at King's College London, a former senior policy advisor to Prime Minister Gordon Brown, and also a regular contributor to Financial Times and to the Nikkei Asian Review, for which you cover all matters relating to energy. On the other side of the line, we have Simone Tagliapetra. You're a senior fellow, fellow sorry, at Bruegel in Brussels and an adjunct professor of energy, climate and environmental policy at the Universidad Católica del Sacre Cuere, which I hope I pronounced somewhat correctly, and also at John Hopkins SACE in Europe. You also recently published Global Energy Fundamentals at Cambridge University Press, which I'm sure will be very relevant to this conversation. Um, thanks a lot to both of you for coming on the show. Let's get right to it. What was the extent of the EU's reliance on, on Russian gas and oil? How has this reliance shaped the way various member states in the EU as a whole built their foreign policy and more precisely built their response to the invasion of Ukraine by Russia over the past 10 days? Uh, let's turn first to, to Nick and then we'll go back to Simone. Uh, okay, well, good afternoon. I, the EU imports about um, 47% of the gas it needs um, from Russia and a quarter of the oil that it needs. Hmm. Uh, that, those figures are high enough, but I think you have to look specifically at Germany, hmm. uh, which imports uh, a third of its oil and more than a third of its gas from Russia. And those are significant volumes in a country that has virtually no reserves of its own. I think that that key relationship between Russia and Germany is the thing that has determined where Europe's got to of dependence on, on what was the Soviet Union is now Putin's Russia. Hmm. And Professor Taglia-Pietra, 
what do you make of this uh, specific reliance on from Germany? Yes, absolutely. Uh, as Professor Butler said, Europe is very highly dependent on Russian energy, and this has been the case now for more than 50 years. Mm. It must be, uh, it is always useful to, to remember that this energy partnership has been forged uh, during the Cold War, even mm. if at the time the US uh, uh, administrations over time were of course not favorable to such a development and that in different moments also tried to boycott the building of uh, these uh, pipelines uh, interconnections between Russia and Europe. Europe has decided to go very strongly with Russia on gas but also on oil and uh, even after the 2006-2009 gas crisis and even after the annexation of Crimea in 2014, mm. the dependency of Europe on Russian gas namely has actually increased. This tells a lot about uh, the how the political elites in Europe have, have considered Russia so far and have dealt with Russia in a way that basically I would say, uh, you know, there was a little bit this understanding that uh, Russia uh, was actually a reliable supplier. And uh, this is why this crisis represents really a watershed moment for, for, for Europe. And we have been seeing over the last 10, 10 days a uh, U-turn of really long lasting foreign policy and energy policy uh, guidelines in Europe in general and in Germany in specific. More generally, how can we explain this dependence on gas and especially on, on Russia? Um, I think we can all remember quite clearly that not too long ago, Angela Merkel and Germany were quite strongly committed towards building the Nord Stream 2 pipeline with, with Russia. Um, you've pointed out this actually this reliance has increased since 2014 with Crimea, since 2008 in Georgia. Um, how can we describe this? Is this kind of form of naivete? Was it pure economic necessity? Was it perhaps a absolute lack of strategic thinking in the way we approach energy, where we can focus mostly on the business fundamentals, but not so much on the, on the political uh, risk as well? Um, Professor Butler, how do, how do you explain this increased reliance despite all of those tensions in the background? I think it, it was a strategic judgment, actually, by Mrs. Merkel and others that uh, building a relationship, commercial relationship with with Russia was the way to bring Russia into the modern world economy. Mm. Uh, and to, uh, to the best way, rather than confrontation, to, do, to deal with a very big presence overhanging Europe. Uh, I think that went too far. I think it was then tainted by a degree of uh, what we in the UK would call corruption, mm. which is the engagement of people like Mr. Schroeder uh, uh, as paid officials within the Russian energy system, <laughs> which I, mm. I think uh, encouraged the Social Democrats not to challenge what was happening. So I think it, it began with its own logic. I think the logic went too far. Uh, mm. And now, uh, as Siran said, I think we're, we're learning the consequences of that. You should never be too dependent on anyone. In, in the energy world. Mm -hmm. um, Professor Tagli Pietra, is it, what was their vision? Did we kind of blunder into the whole situation or, you know, were we blind or were we delusional or did we not care? I don't know, how, how do you, well, what do you make of it? I very much agree that that was a combination of uh, self-interest on the one hand, because for Europe uh, getting the gas from Russia was easy because the mm. infrastructure was there, the gas mm. has always come over, and even in a pretty cheap uh, uh, manner, you know, compared also to, to compare to LNG, et cetera. So there was a certain relaxation on that front. On the other, I very much agree that our political leaders have been half blind with Putin. We all remember uh, not only the, the German uh, chancellors that were mentioned, but also, for example, the former Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi mm. and the personal and the personal relationship that uh, he had with uh, with Putin and so on, also several others uh, European leaders. So there was a sort of appeasement with uh, with uh, with Russia also for these personal relationships. And again, I think. Uh, 
nobody could really uh, imagine Putin to go uh, that way. And mm. I think that uh, this invasion and this war in Ukraine is something that uh, uh, no one in the uh, European capitals would have really expected the, the day before. So this really came as a, as a huge shock to, to, to all the uh, political leaders, to all the energy business leaders as well, I would say. And uh, out of this shock, Europe is really uh, making up its mind and really now reinventing itself. And what we have seen coming out of the Berliamont uh, with uh, the new uh, uh, energy strategy of, of the European Commission is uh, it's really, really, really strong. I mean, the idea of mm. getting rid by 80% of Russian gas already this year is a target that was announced by uh, President von der Leyen, by uh, Franz Timmermans, which is something completely unbelievable uh, up to two, two weeks ago. Uh, Professor Butler, I think you wanted to add something. No, I, I think it's all been covered on, on this question. Okay. Well, now that we've sort of, you know, taken stock of the energy dependence of Europe, uh, Europe's energy dependence uh, on Russia, uh, let's try to focus now on, on sanctions and kind of the, the strategy that we're seeing West, West European and Western governments more largely uh, roll out in, in response to the, to the invasion of, of Ukraine. Um, and the question here is, what, um, how much margin does Europe really have in uh, rolling out these sanctions without running the risk of blackout. Germany, Germany's foreign minister uh, warned that a you know a halt to oil and oil and gas imports would mean that the lights would go out. So um, could we be on the brink of blackouts in case of an of an escalation in sanctions? How long can we hold without these imports? Uh, starting with uh, Simone and then turning to Nick. Well. Honestly, uh, I mean, we at Bruegel have done the numbers and uh, the European Commission had uh, done the numbers as well, and many others have done the numbers. And uh, here it seems that uh, um, Europe can cope with an interruption of Russian gas, certainly over the next months, because we are now approaching uh, the, the end of the winter. We still have around 30% of our gas in storage and with uh, increased levels of LNG imports, we can get to the spring. The, the big problem is what do we do with the spring and the summer, a period in which Europe needs to, to fill up the storages. And that's exactly mm. the, the key challenge in order to get prepared for the next winter, eventually without Russian gas. And in order to do that, the EU will need to put in place a major unprecedented political and diplomatic uh, set of tools. On the one hand, Europe will have to buy this gas jointly. So this idea of the joint purchasing of gas might finally mm take place. It was first proposed in 2015 after the annexation of Crimea. Uh, but then we will need to do a big diplomatic push with the LNG producers to try to increase production and export to Europe as much as possible. And we know very well that this is a problem because the global LNG capacity now is almost fully utilized. And therefore, uh, this will not be so easy. But still, over the last months, I think it's important to consider that Europe has managed to compensate the lower volumes of Russian gas supplies with increased imports of LNG. And as a matter of fact, the uh, European reliance on, on Russian gas, January, February uh, 2021 versus 2022 has already decreased from a level of 47% to a level of 28%. Mm. Can, I, yes. uh, can I gently disagree with that mm. view? I think um, Europe can reduce its dependence on Russia, uh, but I don't think it can do it totally and quickly. Uh, I think it would need time to reopen the LNG facilities. I think it would take time to bring gas from the Middle East or the, or the US, it could be done. But I think if we do this immediately, as the US seems to be suggesting, I think there is a real risk of uh, having to have rationing. Uh, Europe, as you say, has cut, it, cut down its dependence on Russia, but to replace 28% of your supply overnight I don't. I just don't believe that that is feasible, and that seems to be what the German and the Dutch governments are saying. 
I think we should be reducing step by step and replacing step by step. Uh, but if we do it now, and of course, Mr. Putin won't be helpful in the process of us doing it gradually, he'll cut it off immediately because he has the power to do that and uh, and show us what we're getting into. So I think we are into a really dangerous period where energy is being used as a political weapon by Mr. Putin and we don't have an immediate response. And mm -hmm. and sorry, and one more point is, is that he's benefiting from the surge in prices that the speculation mm -hmm. over possible embargoes is now introduced into the market. Mm -hmm. He's reaping the benefit because the, the flows of oil and gas are still going and he's getting the money for them. Hmm. Professor Tagli Petra? Yeah, I wanted to say that uh, uh, I very much agree on the fact that in the short term, uh, an eventual halt of, of Russian supplies, just to be clear, cannot be compensated by LNG alone. Huh? It, hmm. we, it will be a portfolio of options to yes. compensate that. So LNG is one part of the story and we know that that is not gonna be easy. We know that it's gonna be very difficult to attract additional volumes, for example, from Algeria and Norway because these countries are struggling to produce more and they have said mm -hmm. that repeatedly. So what we will have to do is actually do a lot of gas to coal switching in order to, uh, to reduce uh, this gas demand in the in the power sector and compensate that with coal but then we will really need to ask citizens to turn down the thermostat by one two degrees in order to limit the gas demand by another 10 percent and i agree in certain countries that are particularly dependent on russian gas namely in the east uh, rationing will have to happen in an orderly manner still, but happening in the industrial sector. So this is certainly not going to be easy in that scenario, but mm. uh, I think Europe is now better off than 2014 to face this eventual uh, scenario. But of course, since uh, European leaders and uh, the German chancellors have just been more vocal than others saying uh, we are not there yet, you know? we are not willing to compromise our economy, our economic uh, recovery uh, to, to with, to, in order to impose a ban on Russian energy. That's exactly why we see the US and the UK going mm. that way while Europe is not. Um is there possibly a kind of grand bargain to be made with the United States? I was reading your, your, your colleague, um, Nick, in the Financial Times, uh, Rana, um, I forget her last name. Um, she was writing a, a, a column on Financial Times saying that perhaps there was some kind of landing ground between the United States and Europe where the United States increases shale production, for example, and exports a lot more to Europe. And in exchange down the road, it accepts European standards on, you know, on carbon down the road. Uh, is this a possibility? Is this kind of a, um, a possible landing ground for Europeans to avoid paying uh, excessively high um, amounts for the energy uh, with all the blackout risks it would avoid? Do you think it's a possibility? I think it's it could be one part of the story. And I think Europe, if it stops using anymore, Russian gas will need to import LNG from the US and elsewhere. Uh, I think there could be a bargain around that. I think the US is, and the US firms are very keen to sell the LNG to Europe. Um, and there is plenty of capacity in the US shale industry. Hmm. The key point, the problem is that it can't be done instantly. Hmm. I mean, the LNG has to be processed, transported, processed again, brought to the market wherever it's needed. That's a matter of weeks, maybe a small number of months. So if this week Europe decides to cut off Russian supplies, we're going to be short, all of us, in the, uh, on continental Europe and in the UK. Mm. If we do it gradually, we can probably manage through one deal or another, including mm. re generally reducing and, and as Simon said, moving to, back to coal in some cases even. Um, but there's no instant answer to this. We would be damaging ourselves by having a short term uh, close down of uh, gas supplies from Russia. Um what does the portfolio look like then, uh, Simone? How, how um, are we going to look to you know Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, more call? What what do you expect the portfolio to look like? 
Well, in my view, uh, the situation is the following. Europe cannot go for an energy embargo on Russia unless there are guarantees from the United States that, number one, the LNG from the US will come over to Europe at a competitive price in the spring and in the summer to fill up the storages. Mm -hmm. Number two, that there is an, an active engagement of the US to secure that uh, uh, way more oil is produced in Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, which are the countries that today have uh, uh, the largest uh, spare capacity, which is not going to be easy because we all know that, for example, the United Arab Emirates abstained at the uh, UN General Assembly over Ukraine. And uh, we know that uh, the Saudis are also having their own relationship with the Russians. So this is not going to be easy. And that's why Europe is not going down the way of the embargo yet. But I think mm. this will really depend on the evolution of the war in Ukraine, because should the brutalities we have seen of the last days continue, well, a social pressure will mount to uh, to do something more here, because we have put financial sanctions, we have sanctioned the central bank, etc. But as we keep sending hundreds of millions of euro every day to, to Russia, this also becomes a way for them to fund the war. So I think uh, this discussion might be just postponed should the events in Ukraine further the deteriorate over the next days. Yeah. And let's uh, turn to the other side of the equation now uh, and look at Russia's economy. Um, you know, how, um, I mean, how can Russia uh, um, decouple from Europe uh, or at least decouple its energy sector from Europe and still remain a, uh, a, a big uh, exporter of oil and gas? I mean, um, you know, we've seen obviously a number of uh, Western companies uh, um, you know, pull out of Russia. We've seen BP, Shell, uh, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Norway. Um, so the question is, could uh, without these uh, without these investments into Russia's oil, uh, oil and gas sector, uh, can can the can the can, can the country remain a big player in in global energy markets? Starting with uh, Professor Butler and, and turning to Simone. Uh, it can. I think you have to separate oil and gas. I think the oil market is liquid. Uh, Russia can put its oil onto tankers uh, and send them anywhere around the world and they soon become anonymous. You don't know where it's come from and there are plenty of countries that would would buy it. Uh, and in, including probably without knowing it, some European countries would end up buying it. Uh, so oil, they can keep the level of production and exports that they have with fairly lit little disruption. The gas is much more difficult uh, they have just signed or begun to sign two new deals to sell gas to China. I think the Chinese are now getting some, something like cold feet about those deals because they don't trust the government in Moscow and they don't want to be uh, dependent on them any more than, than we are. So I think it's not so easy. And those, those lines will take years to build from uh, Siberia and from Sakhalin to China would take years to build. So they have an immediate problem. I think uh, gas is important for Mr. Putin. A lot of his personal income seems to come through Gazprom. And um, I think the Russian economy short term, you see the chaos in the markets and the ruble going down. I think Russia would have a real problem if Europe progressively and sensibly uh, decouples its gas supply, as we've been saying earlier. Hmm. Professor Tagli Petra? Yes, I very much agree with this assessment. And uh, it is indeed very important to, to look at the situation from an holistic perspective. Europe doesn't only import gas, it imports also oil, coal, nuclear fuel from Russia. So the situation is uh, way more complicated than uh, one can think. And uh, what Nick said is, in my view, very, very right. I mean, uh, the oil market is a global market, is a unique sort of swimming pool. and. Uh, if uh, Russia doesn't export oil to Europe, well, it can redirect flows to, to, to China. And uh, that is technically feasible and apparently also politically viable because we are seeing these days the first signs that uh, the Chinese are even interested in investing now into the uh, Russian energy energy sector, given the the state of of the situation and the 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 the, the escape of the Western companies, so 
China might stand ready to support Russia here and uh, might notably stand ready to do uh, business in a moment in which uh, the, the, the Russian market is, let's say, in a very complicated situation. So that is also uh, what the, the Europeans have been thinking about these days. I mean, if we go for an embargo, but then the oil price uh, uh, skyrockets to uh, $200 per barrel and Russia still manages to sell the oil to the Chinese, even if uh, at lower volumes, but with the price uh, effect, they will be able to get basically the same revenues and we will be compromising the European economy while they will in any case be able to make the money. So that is what uh, is leading, you know, and really uh, sustaining this prudence on the European side, given the volumes of the exchange. Again, as it was mentioned before, uh, the EU imports uh, substantial volumes of both gas and oil, while the US and also the UK do not. So these, I think, we need to consider volumes matter. Um, let's pivot back to, to Europe. Um, we recently did another episode on energy with uh, Aito Hernandez from Political, Politico EU and Thomas um, pedrin And one of the main topics was a fierce battle around the taxonomy of the various energy sources. And it was a quite fierce battle, uh, especially between France and Germany, for example, on what different energy should be uh, called, you know, transition energy, green energy. Um, do you think perhaps there's a little bit of um, schadenfreude, to use a German word, in France currently, to see the geopolitical bind that the reliance on gas has put many countries in Europe in, compared to France, who's been relying much more heavily on nuclear, which seems a lot more viable? Do, do you think, to be clear, that the past few weeks have made the case for nuclear a lot stronger? And perhaps could we even see a country like Germany uh, halt its uh, ending of its nuclear program? I believe it's still three nuclear facilities that only got recently shut down and probably possibly could be reopened. Do you think the entire conversation around nuclear has been completely upended now, uh, Professor Butler? Uh, not quite upended. I, I think um, the, the last few days really have shown us that we're uh, over dependent on gas imports from one country. I think what we'll, what we'll see Europe do over a period of time is reduce that dependence. I, I don't see a dramatic shift away from gas as a source of uh, power and light and electricity within the economy. Mm -hmm. I think looking ahead, nuclear has an opportunity, but it's got to be careful to take it. I think the, the best nuclear options are the small modular reactors that people like Rolls-Royce are producing and just starting to get um, approvals for. Uh, I think they offer a lower cost uh, way of producing electricity. But we'll still, I mean, most of the gas in Europe is, is not used for power generation. It's used in industry. Mm. And that's true in Germany. And that cannot easily be substituted by electricity. So I don't think gas is finished. It's, it, the, the challenge is to get a distributed set of sources of supply. Hmm. And Professor Taglia Petra? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Fully agree. I mean, gas uh, will continue to play an important role in the European energy system for, for uh, at least the next two decades. And that's really what we all also see in the energy scenarios of the European Commission itself, the European Green Deal scenarios, etc. So I think here, uh, Europe will possibly emerge from this crisis with an acceleration of the green transition, if that is even possible. So with stronger uh, focus on uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency. So I think uh, this will be really the medium long term uh, way out of the situation here. But the problem of Europe will be to manage the short term outlook to manage a situation in which over the next months and years, possibly, uh, we need to substitute Russian volumes. Their nuclear can't help because the building of nuclear power plants takes, as we know, a very long time. There are certain countries that had already decided before the war to double down on nuclear like France and they will certainly do that but I don't see other countries now deciding to go for nuclear because of the war. These countries will try to replace as much as possible Russian gas with other gas sources, LNG and other pipeline suppliers 
but certainly not go nuclear. They will certainly try to accelerate the deployment of renewable energy and namely the offshore wind energy, which is a very promising uh, source of energy for Europe. And for, for, for our uh, last question, um, you know, one of the more interesting developments uh, over the past few days is, is, is that, you know, this, this question of Europe's dependence on Russian uh, energy has been conflated with the um, uh, transition towards, a green, towards greener sources of energy, right? I mean, President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, it has been, um, you know, um, um, hailing this, this movement to, to wean Europe off uh, Russian energy as, as a big step towards the, the, uh, the, the European Green Deal. Do you, do you, ex do you expect um, more strategic thinking from Europe around those issues, around the intersection of you know, uh, energy and Europe's um, you know, independence in that score and, and, the, and the transition uh, to, to a greener economy? Is that, is that uh, likely in your, in your view, uh, starting with uh, Professor Butler? I think it's possible. I, I'm not sure that that's going to be the case. I think you are now going to see, I think you are going to see a recession because of these high prices. I think you see government spending, fiscal balance very stretched in many European countries. I think there will be more of what I think of as first generation renewables, wind and solar, but I'm not sure that the money is there either from governments through borrowing or from the retail consumer who are now facing going to face very high bills to, to uh, invest in uh, the next generation of renewables uh, such as hydrogen. So I think this has a complex, this is a complex story and it's not simple. I, I also think that we shouldn't rule out the fact that crises come to an end. I think there will be quite a lot of momentum in many places to rebuild the relationship with Russia. I don't think it's a permanent split yet. And uh, I, I would put a small bet that we're still importing quite a lot of Russian gas in 10 years time. Professor Tagliapietro, maybe, you know, have we thought about other um, areas where we would be vulnerable in case of kind of major geopolitical tensions? You know, let's say there's issues with Taiwan and China. Mm -hmm. Um, would there be, for example, a strategic issue over rare, uh, critical rare mater raw materials? Sorry, critical rare materials from China? Yeah, well, of course. Uh, I mean, if you look at the geopolitics of uh, uh, European uh, European energy, gas, uh, uh, and the, the 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 dependency or over dependency on Russia has been the main item of the world of yesterday and the world of today, of course, while looking more at the world of tomorrow, the over-dependency of Europe on China for critical raw materials, for solar panels, batteries, etc., mm -hmm. it's the upcoming geopolitical risk that is often identified by, by analysts in this space. And for that, I think the, the call for so-called strategic autonomy, as President Macron uh, likes mm -hmm. to put it, uh, will just grow after what we are seeing. So I think the, the, the recognition in Europe that uh, we need to stand up and uh, build our own uh, independence or partial independence, because I doubt Europe will ever be energy independent as the United States. Uh, we, we are not that kind of continent. Uh, but still, we can manage risk, we can diversify supply chains, we can try to build domestically as much as we can. And I think uh, uh, this trend, which was already there with, uh, you know, industrial policy, etc., will be uh, strengthened in the coming years. Hmm. I think that's a, a good place to, to, to land on. And if Professor Butler has anything to add um, no, on this No, I, I agree with those comments. Okay. Um, thanks a lot to the both of you. Um, thanks a lot to our listeners for tuning in. We will be obviously monitoring what's going on in Ukraine over the past few weeks, but we thought this conversation that we started a few months ago had been completely upended by what happened in Ukraine. So we gave all of you a follow up on this question. Thanks a lot, Professor Butler. Thanks a lot, Professor Sagi Petra. And to all our listeners, I say to you, see you next week. So, Nick Butler and Simone Taglia Pietra are out. Jorge, what are your thoughts on all of this? 
Well, so one of the one of the more interesting uh, thoughts that were sparked by this conversation is that you know, incidentally, uh, about it, you know, speaking about a totally different topic this morning, I, I feel like you know our, our audience would appreciate knowing that this morning we had a conversation with someone from uh, the think tank world, from from mm. the, the the kind of the um, the NGO, the third third sector, uh, and this person was talking again about a totally different topic mm. about. Uh, funding for think tanks. Yeah. And this person said, you know, the better way to go about funding your think tank is to diversify your sources of funding. Um, and, and so much so that he is, he specifically uh, 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 mentioned uh, one uh, uh, American think tank that has capped the, the amount that it receives from any one uh, uh, um, uh, philanthropist yeah. to 4%. So that you know, whichever, however much you want to donate, uh, you cannot donate more than 4% of the total funding that goes to this think tank. And I think you could make a very similar case uh, for, you know, and, and the, the rationale for this is obviously that, you know, if if you lose a donor, you're not losing all, all, all your money. You're not losing a big deal. You're losing at most 4%. And I think that a very, that it was very interesting. I mean, it, this this conversation about a totally different topic in this case Russian energy and how we can wean Europe off of Russian energy, you know, it. The, the, I think that that you could apply a similar argument that you know uh, Europe has made itself incredibly vulnerable by depending on Russian oil mm. so much and gas. It has made itself incredibly uh, subservient to Russia's whims, um, and I think what you're seeing now as part of this sort of geopolitical awakening of the European continent is that, you know, we're now seeing at last, and it, again, it has taken a war for Europe to really awaken uh, and know and know what time it is. So, but, but, but at least now you're starting to have a conversation, even in Germany about building uh, kind of, and, and what I, what I found, what I found really interesting in, 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 uh, Tag in uh, Professor Tagli Petra's comments is that obviously you cannot become fully energy independent when you're Europe. I mean, Europe just doesn't quite have the same amount of energy resources in its soil. But yet you can, and, and here, here's the, the interesting question that I, I was lucky to ask our, our two guests was, you know, well, how far can you go in sanctioning Russia without running the risk of blackouts? And that's really the key question I think that's being asked of, European governments these last few days, because obviously we're seeing, you know, we're, we're seeing, I mean, Nord Stream 2 is all but dead. Yeah. Uh, uh, America is, is banning Russian oil altogether. Uh, so you're seeing you're seeing a big, big uh, policy steps being taken here. But the question is, how far can we really go without running the risk of bailout of uh, blackouts? There's a bit of a joke in France. Um, which is, uh, en France, on n'a pas de pétrole, mais on a des idées. In France, we don't have petrol, <laughs> but we have ideas. Um, I, I think that's the state of Europe. We, we don't have petrol. We, um, we, we have nuclear, which is the closest thing to self-sufficiency you can get. Sure, you rely on uranium imports from across the world, but it's not as critical. And I think I was reading that even if the price of uranium increased by tenfold or something like that, the, the, the price of nuclear energy would pretty much stay the same but otherwise we, we do not produce that, that, that kind of um energy um it's interesting that you talk about um uh can, can we survive the winter um brugal for which uh, taglia petra works on works or published a report on this exact question they say that we can survive the next few months but but we probably will be in a bit of a bind next year because usually what happens is we make reserves during the summer and we spend them during the winter. And that's a kind of tension we, we, we observed when we were talking about it with uh, Aitor Hernandez Morales and um, Thomas Pellin Carlin a few months ago. Mm -hmm. um, we won't be able to stock up. So the question becomes, well, we have to do, reach into an agreement with the United States. Because the United States right now is pushing for a pretty strong maximalist position. Um, it wants to block oil, all oil imports from Russia. Now, it's quite easy for, for, for America to do this because that basically energy is sufficient to a large extent. Um, mm. They don't re rely on Russian gas or oil or, or any kind of very marginal amount. They can really, really easily be outsourced to other countries. Um, it's not the case for Europe. I was reading mm. reading some of the numbers for 2020. Um, 
I mean, for all the numbers to Europe are somewhat low, except for the Netherlands, maybe where there's a lot of oil coming from 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 Russia. Most of the oil these days goes to China. Um, but much more importantly, the gas. Wow, twenty percent of gas exports in twenty twenty went to Germany. Then you get ten percent to Italy. Um, then six percent to France down the road. Um, and the countries who are pushing for the strongest strongest uh, uh, response to Russia are countries which really don't depend that much. You know, United Kingdom, United States. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's not it's not an easy position. But uh, again, I think I think there's a landing ground if the Americans decide to make up for the losses that the, the Europeans would suffer by providing uh, energy to to, to Europe. Uh, we'll have to see. Um, you know, yeah. I, I could see a whole kind of very American branding of. Uh, liberty liberty gas you know for example yeah um i was seeing also some very old world war ii posters where they would encourage people to carpool to to drive together to avoid spending uh, uh, oil um inefficiently and there was all these amazing 20 sorry 1942 posters of americans driving alone in the car and there was a ghost of hitler in the car with him saying when you're driving alone you're driving with hitler I don't know. So I, I don't think we're going to see that kind of uh, propaganda these days. But um, but there might be actually that's something we haven't talked too much about. But we might be encouraged to moderate our use of energy. Um, now maybe not just us yeah. individuals, but also you know different companies or rest of it. Uh, I'm sure we might see campaigns, European campaigns, where they'll tell us please make sure you uh, you turn off your lights when you leave the room. Uh, try to keep the heater. Uh, you know. Uh, wear a jumper for Ukraine, something along those lines, um, or sweater for yeah. American if you want to, In other words, Francois, in, in dietary terms, if you want to thin, if you want to, if you want to thinner, uh, um, it, if you want to lose weight, you can you can stop eating. <laughs> that's always an option. That's a possibility. Um, yeah. Although if if you eat a lot, you, you're warmer. So maybe you know, eat a burger for Ukraine. That could be another campaign. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It might be interesting. We might see about those kinds of campaigns come back, come back. Uh, yeah. I, I really hope we get, uh, if you drive alone, you're driving with Putin. That'd be an amazing campaign. Um, uh-huh. That'd be pretty funny. But uh, no, and, and, you know, and you, you I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. You know, just something you said earlier about Nord Stream 2. Um, I, I wish we talked a little bit more about Nord Stream 2. But I think in itself, it's quite remarkable that we mentioned it at some point. And that was it. We didn't say much about it. Nord Stream 2 has been the big energy debate in Europe for the past decade. I remember when I was in the US in, what, 20, 2015, maybe? People were already fighting over Nord Stream 2. It was the yeah. alpha and omega of that, com- of that kind of European energy conversation. Now it seems like it's dead overnight. Like, never say never. It could come back and you know, the, the, the facilities are still there, so it's going to be tempting. But it's remarkable to see how quickly the conversation has shifted. Um, overnight, up now, uh, a project for which Angela Merkel fought, fought tooth and nail for was dropped overnight. Um, and, it, yeah. and it's quite remarkable. They, they were telling us how it wasn't really naive from, from, from Germany, maybe a little bit. It was kind of a maybe wishful thinking that they could include Russia in the kind of European economy and therefore in the kind of European uh, liberal sphere. Um, yeah. and, and it died overnight. Right, and again, remember, I think I think uh, our friend, uh, our dear friend of the show, uh, Ben Haddad, mm. makes this point very eloquently when he says that at its core, the European Union is a project that seeks to build peace through commerce, mm. and the, I, I, I totally concur with you here that the underlying rationale rationale for uh, Nord Stream Two was that you could link. Uh, the European and Russian economies, and and therefore avert yep. conflict. And what we're seeing is that we've g- gotten into a conflict despite yep. uh, Nord Stream two being up until just a few days ago still a possibility. I mean, the pipeline was essentially going to start carrying all this all this oil very soon. But but I think there's something else that that you said that I that I found very interesting, Francois, mm-hmm. which which is that whether this whether we're going to see a, a sort of united Western response to Russian. To, to Russia's invasion in terms of energy. I mean, um, I, I, I was even going back to um, a few of uh, Donald Trump's speeches that I think were that I think have aged very well. I mean, when you think of America's energy posture uh, towards this crisis, I, I, I'm reminded of 
uh, Trump's, uh, I believe, first or second speech to the General Assembly of the United Nations in 2017 or 2018, I forget. But at the at the General Assembly, he said it is fundamentally reckless for a country to tie itself so major, so majorly, I mean, to, to, but to be so dependent on one source of energy. And what is so funny about that part of the speech is that in the recording, uh, in, in that cut, the camera turns to the German delegation at the UN and they're all laughing their hearts out. Yep. You know, they, 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 they see, they saw Trump as a laughing stock, yep. but Trump was yep. right that Europe should have diversified its energy um, imports. And I think, and I think there there is going to be a, a big kind of Western unified uh, front on this. I mean, you're you're already starting to see some splintering. I mean, obviously, some countries are less adamant than others. Some are more kind of you know, uh, some have more for for geopolitical reasons. Some are going to want to uh, um, still retain some of that energy uh, uh, links, but. Um, but I think you're going to see you're going to see a United Energy Front, and what you're going to see a lot of is energy production in America. Yep. America now has, I mean, uh, I, Biden's policies obviously have been, uh, you know, but Biden has sort of reverted to to Barack Obama's policy of, uh, you know, strong environmental protection, so kind of strong curbs on on oil and gas, um, even halting the Keystone Pipeline, which is kind of another big infrastructure project that was being built that is being built in the United States. Um, so what you're going to see is that despite there's a Democrat in the White House, you're going to see a very, you know, made in America sort of policy when it comes to energy. America is going to start ramping up energy production, shale um, and, 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 and liquefied natural gas, uh, because it, it really sees this as an, as an opportunity to become energy independent once and for all, which it can, unlike Europe, it can. America can become energy independent. Hmm. Um one thing I wanted to add on Nord Stream, I was reading up um, earlier today that it, it denied it was filing for bankruptcy. So yeah, it's maybe not filing for bankruptcy, but it can't stretching can't be too good. Um, the certification of the gas pipeline is suspended, so it could be unsuspended down the road. Who knows? Mm. Um, but I don't know. It just it just seems like it was a bit of a a momentous moment. Um, does trade to do economic interactions limit the possibility of war? Um, I think all the students of history will have 1914 in mind, where the European economies were massively integrated with each other. Yeah. They did not stop the escalation. Um, uh, you know, is, was it despite the economic ties? Was it because of the economic ties and the rivalry created? Who knows? Um, but it's, it was, you know, it made me think of this of this example. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, as as we as we told uh, you a bit earlier in the episode, we will try to follow what's going on in Ukraine and bring different angles. You know, the energy angle, uh, but we're thinking of different angles we could bring up. So, uh, stay tuned for all of that. We wanted to thank all our wonderful patrons for joining us and supporting us. Uh, thank you so much for your support. Uh, it's really your support that makes sure with our lights, so to speak, the metaphorical lights stay on um, week after week and that we keep improving in uh, our capacity and our, um, our work here. So if you want to help us, you can join our patrons. That'd be wonderfully appreciated. If you surprise yourself coming back week after week, or well, maybe you might consider going the extra step and supporting us by uh, giving us as little as you know five dollars a month on our Patreon account, which should be linked down below in the description. Uh, if you can't afford the the, the five dollars, also perfectly understood. Um, but you can do plenty of other small things to help us. You can write a review on Apple Podcasts. These things are always greatly useful to increase our visibility online, so people come up on the show fast. So come find the show faster. And yada yada yada. You could also subscribe on Spotify. You can share it on Twitter, uh, all those different things, which would really appreciate to make sure the show continues to grow and reaches other audiences. Um, thanks a lot, Jorge. And Thank you. to all our listeners, I say see you next week. See you next week.